Thank you for everyone who's staying. And uh, at uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday, I know what you're all thinking, but my response to you is the only thing between me and the beach is you. So with that being said, good. So um, this uh, talk will absolutely concentrate on utilization of visco supplementation in the treatment of knee osteoarthritis. Um, with a subtitle identifying the best patient candidate. But in fact, this is an overall view on osteoarthritis, sort of the state of the art as we know it. Um, it is a CME activity. I, I trust you all have your um, booklets and you know what to do. It's sponsored through the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University of Health System and the Miller Professional Group. And remember, you can get some credits if you fill out the paperwork, but you can't win the lottery if you don't by a ticket. Okay. Um, there are my disclosures. Nobody else has disclosures except for me, so I put them up there twice so that you can see. And uh, the objectives here basically is to go through and allow you to identify the demographics, the impact, the pathophysiology, etiology of osteoarthritis of the knee to implement current guidelines for evaluating patients with OA of the knee, including considerations of comorbidities and their effects on the disease and also the medicines that we use to, to treat, and also to uh, understand the various types of treatment modalities, and then ultimately to uh, look at the types of patients that might be uh, the best to receive uh, hyaluronin therapy. So let's move right into the demographics of this disease. You can see that the numbers of uh, millions of people in this country who have OA radiographically is 28. And uh, symptomatically, about 16 million are, uh, have symptoms, and about 6 million are actually getting treated with medications, 1.2 million with uh, IHA injections, and total knee replacements is uh, 700,000 and rising, as you all probably know very quickly in this country. Um, we're all very aware of the uh, presenting signs and symptoms of this disease, uh, pain in one or more joints, slow kind of progression, worsened with weight-bearing activity, better with rest, uh, worsened with impact loading activity. Uh, and I tell my patients uh, when they ask me what they can do, uh, I say, well, the first thing you don't want to do is jump out of airplanes. Uh, crepitus on motion, tenderness on palpation, bony enlargement, Joint stiffness, limitation of joint motion, and uh, inflammation is usually almost always very limited, but occasionally, exceptionally, there can be quite significant uh, inflammatory flares of this disease, which can be uh, sometimes confounding. Having said that, I do want to point out to everybody in the room, as you all know, it's extremely important to focus on where the pain is coming from. You certainly don't want to be injecting medication into a knee that is painful because of answering bursitis, nor would you want to have a surgeon replace a knee for the same kind of thing. And frequently, people have knee pain related to medial and lateral collateral ligament strain, as well as infra and suprapatellar tendon sprain. So it's very important to uh, do a careful examination so you know what you're treating at any particular time. So the challenges we have in treating this disease is that it's um, very difficult, even if you get it in an initial response, it can be very difficult to maintain that response, particularly over many months, if not years. Um, we usually are using multiple therapies over time. We have safety concerns related to this. There's a lot of lack of compliance. Uh, there are a lot of comorbidities and complications related to this. Uh, we're using concurrent medications, some of which may be somewhat dangerous um, solely and also because of their interactions. Um, it, it also takes a bit of coordinating healthcare providers, including physicians, advanced practitioners, therapists, surgeons, etc. And then there's also the long term potential cost of the disease, which, if you think about it over many years, of all the things that we can do, that may ultimately wind up with a patient having a total joint replacement, clearly that would be, a, it is a very costly uh, situation. Now, how do we manage OA non-pharmacologically? Well, we certainly try to get patients to lose weight. That is an ongoing battle, not an easy one. 
Um, a very difficult one, try to get them to exercise.